There are more than 5,000 colleges in America, and all of them have canceled in-person classes due to the coronavirus outbreak, including our own university, WVU. I'm Michael Rinker. I'm Sydney Hartman. Here at WVU News, we have collaborated with our public affairs show, Morgantown Today, in response to this pandemic to bring you a special edition show, Merging Our Two Classes. And I'm Megan Scarano. Morgantown Today hosts join us now from Studio B at the Media Innovation Center. Madison, Zach. Thanks, Megan. I'm Madison Greer. When we first discovered that our classes would be moved online, we knew it would be challenging to adapt our TV classes but we also understand the importance to report the news, since reporters are considered essential employees during this pandemic. That's right, Madison, and I'm Zach Hawk. So, with our cell phones in hand, we shot everything in our own communities on our iPhones. It may not be perfect, but it is raw and real. We also believe that among all the chaos, there are a lot of positive stories happening in our communities. So that's what we decided to focus on for this special edition show. Our reporters live up and down the East Coast, and they're dedicated to bringing you uplifting stories during these uncertain times. We are also practicing social distancing here in our studios with only the main anchors and the producers present. We kick off our special edition show, Far Apart Together, with an original song that inspired our broadcast. Our own reporters are featured in the music video you're about to watch. We hope you are inspired and uplifted by our stories in this show. Thank you for joining us for our special edition show, Far Apart Together, starts now. You can clean the house from top to bottom, play some board games if you got them, open up the windows and all enjoy the weather. I know it cramps your social style, but how about for a little while? Let's all stay far apart, let's all stay far apart, together. It's your turn to be selfless, and all you have to do is think about the people who might not be as strong as you. Of one thing we can all be sure The world is sick but we're the cure So let's all stay far apart together During this COVID-19 outbreak, one country stands apart from the others. South Korea had over 10,000 cases of the coronavirus in late February and early March. But the number of new cases has since dropped to single digits. Our own Tori Genuso spoke with a WVU alum who lives in South Korea. Will Hirsch explains on why he believes South Korea has been successful at flattening the curve. I'm Tori Genuso reporting from Cecil, Pennsylvania. Experts are currently looking at South Korea as a model on how to flatten the curve here in America. The result in South Korea is a stunning decline in new coronavirus cases since March 1st. I spoke with a WBU graduate who is currently living through this pandemic in South Korea and says there will be light at the end of this tunnel here in America. South Korea is home to more than 51 million people. During the COVID-19 outbreak, South Korea reported more than 10,000 cases and just over 200 deaths to date. William Hirsch, who is currently living and teaching in South Korea, explains how they are getting through this pandemic. I think the first thing that Korea did correctly was uh, they locked, they started mass testing. So they set up uh, drive-in testing. It would take, I think, like 15 minutes, maybe. Uh, at first, I think it took like a day to get results back. But then they figured out a system where they could get, uh, they could get the results in 15 minutes. So the drive-through testing, I think that was huge. Over 100 countries have asked South Korea to assist with testing kits, including the United States. But there's more to it than just testing. So in like a three week period, they would go through your credit card purchases. They would contact the stores you went to. God forbid, if you went to a bar, they would contact the bar and the bar would try and figure out who you were in contact with. So they did a lot of credit card purchasing history. They did a lot of CCTV. Uh, so like if you went to a bar, they would look at the CCTV and say, oh, there's the person that tests positive. Let's figure out who's around them, uh, who touched them who, you know, grabbed the same drink that they grabbed or something like that. William Hirsch will return to teaching when his school reopens on May 4th. For now, he offers some words of encouragement. From my experience in, in Korea, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It will end at some point, but it's only going to end if you take it seriously. Uh, you have to take this seriously. You have to stay home. 
Countries are looking to South Korea for their coronavirus tactics, and many Americans look forward to when they can return to normal as well. William goes on to say the following. South Korea was aggressive with testing early on, and this factor, along with social distancing, is key to flattening the curve. William also wants to tell Americans, to save lives, you have to take this virus seriously, and you must stay home. Reporting for WVU News from Cecil, Pennsylvania, I'm Tori Genuso. Thanks, Tori, for that report. A home economics teacher in Pennsylvania is part of a growing trend, sewing face masks in the midst of a shortage. The CDC is now advising all Americans to wear cloth face masks in public to slow the spread of COVID-19. Reporter Victoria Donatelli met the teacher who was also inspiring her own students to take on a new hobby for a worthwhile cause. I'm Victoria Donatelli reporting from Pittsburgh, PA. I'm currently at Thomas Jefferson High School. The brand new 300,000 square foot building officially opened for the 2019-2020 school year. Now, while schools have switched to virtual learning, that did not stop local sewing teacher from putting her talents to good use in giving back to those who need it most during this pandemic. Michelle Stachovi is a sewing teacher at Thomas Jefferson High School who is currently not working, like other teachers across the country. So she's been spending her time off sewing homemade masks all day long. And I saw that there was the need. Um, I know I have a ton of extra fabric. A, a good friend of mine, her mom passed away, and when she passed away a few years ago, she donated a ton of quilting fabric to me. And I had taken a lot of that fabric to school so the kids could use it, and it's sitting here, so it might as well be put to good use. So far, Michelle has made over 500 masks and does not plan on stopping anytime soon. Everybody was in a panic with the shortage, with um, masks going into the different hospitals and, and things and other healthcare providers and nursing homes. And so I thought, well, what the heck? I have the supplies, why not? And, you know, and it's a good lesson for everybody. Like it's, you know, it's nice to see some of my challenge, some of my students to be able to make some and some have posted pictures what they've made. And so it's been nice. I, I mean, everybody's coming together and I think that's what the most important part is. Michelle has also been encouraging her students to make masks and give back as well. Michelle Stachovi is definitely not alone in her efforts. Thousands of volunteers around the nation are making homemade masks and donating them to those who need it most during this time. For WVU News, I'm Victoria Donatelli. Back to you at the studio. Thanks, Victoria. You can make your own cloth face mask even if you don't sew. Just go to YouTube and search for DIY No Sew Face Mask and thousands of easy tutorials will pop up. That's great information, Michael. While face masks aren't the only items that are hard to come by, the U.S. is facing a hunger crisis as more than 22 million Americans are unemployed. But a Pennsylvania woman wants her community to know there's a stocked pantry on a porch in Dormont that's free to anyone in need. Carla Chugani is helping those in her community by giving away free food and more from her front porch. Chugani says the idea for her porch pantry started with women's menstrual products before the COVID-19 pandemic even began. I had read an article about how sometimes women have to choose between getting menstrual products and buying food to feed their families. And so the original idea that we had was that it was going to be a hygiene pantry. And after the pandemic hit, the porch pantry turned into much more. Some of the items on her porch include non-perishable foods, hygiene products, and children's items such as food and diapers. Her pantry is located at 2958 Bellrose Avenue in Dormont, Pennsylvania. Chugani gets the word out by using her Facebook page, Dormont Little Free Pantry. All of the items on her porch are donated by the community. Chugani says her neighbors have been very active in participating in the pantry. A lot of neighbors have joined the Facebook group. They're engaged, they're asking questions, they're messaging me. Um, so we have really had a chance to connect, but from a distance. Chugani wants to encourage people to come to her pantry whenever they want. It is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, I want folks in, in my local area to know that this is here for you. It's a resource um, and you are absolutely welcome to come whenever you like. No appointment is necessary. Just come and take what you need and come back as often as you need to. You can request certain items through email at hatefreedormont at gmail.com. 
Chugani is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the University of Pittsburgh. She feels lucky that both her and her husband can work from home during this pandemic. The porch pantry will remain open until the stay at home quarantine is lifted. Food shortages are happening nationwide. In Pennsylvania alone, food banks are spending an extra $1 million a week. But one food pantry in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is making sure that no food goes to waste and that anyone who is hungry has access to healthy food. Natalie Comer explains. I'm Natalie Comer reporting from Martinsburg, West Virginia. Did you know one in eight people go hungry every day? Did you know 40% of food is wasted? The 412 Food Rescue is located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and is a nonprofit organization that helps prevent perfectly good food from going to waste by redirecting it to those experiencing food insecurity. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the 412 Food Rescue has taken precautions and remained operational by assisting those in need of food in the safest ways possible. The 412 Food Rescue have made adjustments to their organization after the COVID-19 pandemic arised in Pittsburgh, but this hasn't stopped volunteers from helping others in their community. The 412 Food Rescue partnered with the Latino Community Center and a schools to establish meal distributions for children since schools are closed. Transportation can be a barrier to some families as they may not be able to access food sources. Therefore, food distributions took place at bus stops where kids have access to without their parents and don't necessarily need a car. Senior Director of Advancement Sarah Sweeney says the organization plans on doing more distributions. Many of these children rely on school lunches or breakfast even, and they're, you know, the, the situation has compounded the household's um, ability to feed them the family, including the children. So we're trying our best to make sure that food's reaching people where they already live and that they're able to access the help. Volunteer work is utilized through the app Food Rescue Hero. Through this, volunteers are alerted when food is available to be picked up and dropped off. All the food is dropped off at community partners where individuals have access to pick it up. In the first two weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic, the 412 Food Rescue saw a tremendous surge of people downloading the app. We have a lot of volunteers that are just really eager to get started to support this effort because they see what um, all we've been doing in the community and they want to really lend their hands. Back in November on an off day, Pittsburgh Steelers linebacker TJ Watt volunteered with the organization. Watts helped deliver food to local community centers in the Hazelwood area of Pittsburgh. Watts recently made a financial donation to the organization. He was very, you know, again, very humble and happy to help with what he um, has available to him. So we're very grateful for him. TJ Watt stated on Twitter, Pittsburgh, it is important that during these tough times, we step up as a community and support each other. To learn more about the 412 Food Rescue or to make a donation, visit www.412foodrescue.org. Over the past five years that the 412 Food Rescue has been operating in the Pittsburgh region, they've prevented nearly over 9 million pounds of food from going to waste which is over 7 million meals. If it wasn't for the 412 Food Rescue, that food would have ended up in a landfill. Stay up to date in your community during this time and see how you can help raise awareness around you. I'm Natalie Comer reporting from Martinsburg, West Virginia. Back to you at the studio. Thanks, Natalie. I just love seeing the community come together to help each other out like that. While food insecurity can cause many to hoard food, but officials say there's no reason to panic. We are not running out of food. And with grocery shopping being one of the few reasons we can leave our homes, it's good to know that safety is a top priority during this crisis. Most grocery stores have changed their hours to keep those most at risk for COVID-19 safe. I found out how people are responding to these changes. Across the country, people have seen the rules of social distancing change the way they live their daily lives. One big way lives have changed, the way we grocery shop. The first major change customers saw was a change in store hours. Grocery stores like Walmart, Target, and Aldi altered their hours, allowing only the elderly or customers with weakened immune systems to shop. Carol Reed, a 75-year-old senior citizen of Martinsburg, West Virginia, says she takes advantage of those hours set aside for seniors to help stay healthy during the pandemic. Well, hopefully there won't be as many people during that time and there will only there'll only be old people like me 70 plus 
and uh, I think it's a little safer. Grocery stores took another step in social distancing with the cases of COVID-19 skyrocketing around the country. Now places are limiting the number of customers inside. They count how many people go in the store. Some of the stores count how many people come out and then they let that many people go in. I've seen that happen before, not enough other, either. Now, more recently, stores have one entrance and exit and one-way aisles. Stores hope these guidelines encourage social distancing between customers. Martin's Grocery Store is now requesting only one person per household to shop during the COVID-19 pandemic. The CDC now recommends everyone to wear masks if they have to leave their homes for essential reasons. While Carol is seeing more people with face masks, she thinks more employees should wear protective gear. I just wish their employee would have a little more safety stuff, like masks. Some, some of them don't have masks. And some, like for instance, putting out fruits and vegetables, they, there I think they should wear gloves. Although there have been many changes to the way we live our lives, Leaders want to ensure that the public knows grocery stores will not close during the COVID-19 pandemic. Authorities encourage that only one person in your household should go grocery shopping, leaving the rest of the family at home. This idea is to minimize the spread and exposure to families and the elderly. Thanks, Megan. If there is a silver lining during this pandemic, it's that families are rediscovering meals together around the dinner table. That's true, Michael. I know my own family has been eating together nearly every night. And coming up after the break, reporter Glenn Kittle is cooking a comfort food favorite in his kitchen at home in Connecticut. You don't want to miss it. When we started our journey, we had no idea where it would lead us. Until we found a place where experiences became a way of life and connections became unbreakable bonds. For us, it's a second home and wherever we roam, it will always be a part of us the place we became Mountaineers. Welcome back to our special edition show, Far Apart Together. I'm Madison Greer here at Studio B at the Media Innovation Center. Here at Morgantown today, we've collaborated with our Emmy Award-winning newscast, WVU News, to bring you a new kind of newscast of hope and optimism during this pandemic. And I'm Zach Hawk. In response to our university and thousands of colleges across the nation moving to online classes, we knew we needed a creative way to deliver the news from our own communities. We did this by shooting our stories on our iPhones. We admit technically it's not our best work, but it's a reality check on how to report on stories, during a worldwide pandemic. That's true, Madison. And if you can look at the glasses half full during this crisis, it's that families are bonding together in the kitchen. And listen to this, Zach. With restaurants closed for business, Americans are cooking and eating at home. The New York Times reports on a scale not seen in over 50 years. Wow, I believe it. And I don't know about you, Madison, but I have been craving comfort foods. Our own Glenn Kittle is cooking one of America's favorite comfort foods, mac and cheese, from his hometown of Torrington, Connecticut. Hi, I'm Glenn Kittle reporting to you from Torrington, Connecticut. And while normally I'd be reporting to you from the studio today, I'm gonna be bringing you inside the kitchen. That's right, with millions of Americans across the nation practicing quarantine protocols, that means millions more Americans in the kitchen. And according to the New York Times, two of the most common things found in your fridge or in your cabinets are pasta and cheese. So I figured what better way to celebrate this quarantine than by making a good old fashioned homemade mac and cheese. So without further ado, let's get in the kitchen and get started. Now, I know what you're thinking. Mac and cheese, it's a simple dish, everybody makes it, but it's actually really important at a time like this because cheese can only last in your fridge for about two weeks. Whereas a box of pasta on average sits on an American shelf for about two months. So what we're doing is utilizing every bit of food in your fridge and in your cabinet to make sure that you're not making those extra trips to the grocery store during this quarantine. Well, the first step to making any mac and cheese is to fill your pot with water. I took my pot and filled it up just about three quarters of the way, then brought it on over to the oven. Right from there, I turned the heat on high to make sure I got my boil going quickly and added three pinches of salt to the water just for flavor purposes. 
As that's going, you can see the pot starts boiling, so it's time to get the pasta. Make sure you put it in gradually and continue to stir so that way the pasta doesn't stick together. While the pasta's going, though, I'm gonna start grating my cheese. I start off with four ounces of cheddar, then I went out with four more ounces of mozzarella and also added eight ounces of Romano. All right, the pasta looks done, so we go on ahead and strain that and wait a little bit while we go ahead and make our cheese sauce. All right, to start off with the cheese sauce, you're gonna need one stick of butter. From there, you're gonna wait for that to melt and then add six tablespoons of all-purpose flour. After that, you're gonna wanna add three cups of milk and add all of your cheese in. You stir that until it starts to get thick, so it looks a little bit like this. From there, we season with both salt and pepper and mix that in. Now here comes the fun part, adding the pasta. Now the sauce was actually a little thicker than I anticipated, so I had to move on over to a bigger pot. After we're done stirring, all there is left to do is add some breadcrumbs to the top. Then you throw that into the oven at 325 for about 15 to 20 minutes, so that way the breadcrumbs get nice and crispy, and then you're ready to go. Well, that's pretty much all there is to it to make a beautiful three cheese breaded mac and cheese that the whole family can enjoy. If you wanna look up more recipes that utilize some other ingredients in your cabinet that you haven't used in a while, visit the link at the bottom of your screen. Remember to stay safe out there. And reporting from Torrington, I'm Glenn Kittle. Thanks, Glenn. Now I want some mac and cheese, Zach. Well, being quarantined at home not only means that Americans are cooking together, they're also focusing on home improvement projects. Being homebound is becoming the norm across America, so millions of people are finding that they finally have the time to complete outdoor projects. I caught up with a professional landscaper about what you can do to improve the value of your home. While socially distancing, people have been taking more walks around their neighborhoods than usual and noticing the springtime landscapes on display. These sites can be something our communities still share. For Debbie Hawk, time off from work has meant time to finally get that garden planted. I don't get to be in my yard and enjoy, you know, everything starting in the spring. So I have more time than I've ever needed before to actually spend time pruning and planting perennials and trying to get things going for my summer gardens. Early spring is a great time of the year to get started with yard work. Professional landscaper Matt Sutphin has some advice about what you can be planting right now. So you want to plant smaller plants that you can nurture. You want to water them um, once a week if you can. And then after a month or two, you can then develop watering, you know, once or twice a month. Planting flowers can make your yard look nice and they can also become an endless source of gifts for your friends and neighbors. Uh, daylily is $12 for a little stem of it. Now, if you plant one daylily in five years, that's gonna probably be 10 daylilies. So if you dig them out and even just put them on the side of your street with a sign that says free, you know, neighbors helping neighbors, it's a good, good way to save plants and help the community beautify the environment. In Pennsylvania, landscapers are still operating and offering deliveries. Most home improvement stores like Lowe's and Home Depot are offering online ordering and free curbside pickup. Your story makes me want to spruce up my own backyard and patio, Zach. We now toss it over to Michael at the Waterfront TV studio. Michael? Thanks, Madison. Zach? Social media is filled with people singing and dancing during social isolation, and there's good reason for that. Doctors say that music and dance is a stress reliever, and we could all use more of that during this pandemic. And in Parkersburg, West Virginia, a dance studio is teaching students virtually. Jillian Wanowski explains. Hi, I'm Jillian Wanowski reporting from Parkersburg, West Virginia. And if you take a look behind me, you'll see an empty parking lot. On a typical weeknight, this parking lot would be full with parents dropping their students off for dance class. But even though classes are canceled, dancers are still showing up for class. Or should I say, signing on. 12-year-old Ellie Needif is supposed to be in the middle of her competitive dance season, but the season was cut short due to the COVID-19 pandemic. But she's still taking classes virtually. It gives me like something to do, and it's also just like fun to do when I'm bored. <laughs> Needif would be missing out on these virtual opportunities without the help of her local dance studio. When Governor Jim Justice closed all public schools in West Virginia, Pace Performing Arts Connection and Education got to work almost overnight. They set up a makeshift dance studio and filmed all classes to be broadcast on the band app for all of their students to use, allowing them to learn and dance like normal from the comfort of their living room. Studio co-owner Lindsay Florence said she hopes that providing classes will encourage dancers to stay motivated while at home. 
it was a worldwide dance studio reaction, I think. And um, it's quite amazing that many dance studios are going online. But it was definitely um, a lot of reaction that everyone's had. Kind of the scary, like uncertain. We don't know what really um, is the right thing to do. But what we do know is we have a service that we actually love to provide to the kids. And they're in a time right now where they actually need it more. Because they're home and they need something, they need a mentor and someone to guide them so that they stay active, stay healthy, and stay positive during this time. So by going online, it's helped us a lot, and I think it's helping the kids. You may think that closing studios might slow down the growth for these dancers, but it looks like they're making the most of their time away. Florence is also busy keeping her college team motivated as the head coach of the West Virginia University dance team. Her younger sister Lexi is a graduating senior and also the president of the team. Having my sister as my coach uh, during this time has been pretty great. Like we lean on each other and like. We, have, we were able to discuss um, what we need to do next that's best for the team. And it's been good to have that kind of um, support so close to home and like in your own home. And I think that we like, I really appreciate it and I am grateful for it because some people don't have that. So it's just about us spreading that to everybody else. To combat losing nationals, the team worked together with college teams across the country to create a week of free masterclasses via Instagram Live. Led by assistant coach Caitlin Burton, the class drew in nearly 100 viewers, bigger than any class held in Morgantown. Dancers were even encouraged to share their videos on social media so that the team could share it on their Instagram. Lexi said they wanted to provide a class for dancers who were hungry for movement right now. Losing nationals is a really negative thing, but I think we're trying to turn into um, an opportunity to uh, find a new pathway to reach people like on a different platform like social media. We always focus on social media, but now it feels like people like we depend on it to reach people and for people to see like what we're doing and to help people and to lift people's spirits. So um, yeah, it's been like a positive spin on a negative situation, but we're really enjoying it. Whether teaching for a small studio or a much larger community, dance clearly has the power to heal many through these uncertain times. The Florence sisters said that the dance team will definitely be holding more virtual dance classes in the future. In Parkersburg, I'm Jillian Wanoski. Back to you at the studio. Just like dance studios, churches all across the country have found new ways to reach their congregations. And in the small town of Westover, residents gather on porches and front lawns to be inspired, uplifted, and reminded that we really are all in this together. Reporter Taylor Hall has more. I'm Taylor Hall reporting from Morgantown, West Virginia. A Westover church has found a way to reach out to the entire community during this time of social distancing. Since Governor Jim Justice issued a statewide stay-at-home order, a Westover church has played a recording of Amazing Grace throughout the city as often as twice a day. Resident Mike Hall, who has been missing his extended family in quarantine, was in the middle of yard work the first time he heard the song. I'm sitting up there and it's happening and my grandson yells over to me and asks me, what is that? And I told him, that's a church apparently singing, because you could tell, and it was from a distance. And um, I stood up there and started singing along. Hall was determined to know where the song was coming from. After a drive, he figured out that residents within a two mile radius of Mount Calvary Assembly of God could hear the music playing. Then when I found out that it was a church that was a mile and a half away from me and I was able to hear it and understand the words being this far away, it was just like, uh, it was just meant to be. Lifelong Westover resident Rhonda Dodson had not been able to listen to Amazing Grace since her father's funeral 10 years prior. I sat down and I was like, oh daddy, let me know I'm doing good. You know, tell me something. And no sooner did I say that, and I hear Amazing Grace playing. Of course, I think I'm losing my mom. I'm like, what? Rhonda called her neighbor, Diana Whitehair, who had been inviting her to church for years. Diana heard the song for herself the following morning. And she was crying and so just excited about it. And I started to cry because I thought, God, through a church in our neighborhood, you gave the song to, and it answered my prayers. 
For some residents, hearing Amazing Grace brings feelings of reassurance and hope. But for Rhonda Dotson, it brought a life-changing message. So when I heard that, you know, right after talking to my dad, I'm like, wow. It was kind of like he was jerking me up saying, come on, Rhonda, get right. He was my rock. He was my savior. I mean, he, he was my daddy. For the residents of Westover, the healing power of music couldn't have come at a better time. I'm Taylor Hall reporting in Morgantown. Back to you at the studio. Thanks, Taylor. What a heartwarming story. It's great to see communities come together during these difficult times. Signing off for the last time this semester. For WVU News, I'm Megan Scarano. And I'm Michael Rinker. We hope that you and your family have been inspired by our special edition show, Far Apart Together. We want to thank our producers, Elisa Schwartzmiller and Jensen Mills, for all their hard work on this show. And I'm Sydney Hartman. Remember, before you know it, we'll be back to backyard barbecues and ball games. Now I'm tossing it over to Studio B at the Media Innovation Center to our Morgantown Today hosts, Madison and Zach. Thanks, Sydney. It's been our pleasure to work with the reporters from WVU News. I'm Madison Greer with Morgantown Today. You can visit us online on our website and you can watch our shows on YouTube. We started our show with a positive message with our special edition open featuring some of our reporters. Now we end the show with the song Country Roads, showcasing former WVU News students who work at TV stations across the country as essential employees. The song features WVU News alum and singer-songwriter Sarah LaMancha. Let those country roads take you safely home. We'll see you next semester. Almost heaven, West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountain, Shenandoah River. Life is old there, older than the trees. Younger than the mountains, growing like a breeze. Country roads, take me home. To the place I belong, West Virginia. Mount Mama, take me home. Country roads, all my memories. Gather round her. Miner's lady, stranger to blue water. Dark and dusty, painted on the sky. Misty taste of moonshine, teardrops in my eyes. Country roads take me home. Virginia, Mount Mama. Take me home, country road. I hear her voice in the morning hour she calls me. The radio reminds me of my home far away. Driving down the road, I get a feeling that I should have been home yesterday. Yesterday, country roads take me home to the place I belong, West Virginia, Mountain Mama. Take me home, country roads. Country roads take me home to the place I belong, West Virginia, Mountain Mama. Take me home, country road. Take me home, country road. Take me home, home, down country road.